Hey everybody, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. This project started for me several years ago in 2019, and I was just reading about how all of our information is being captured for future generations, whether it's Facebook or other social media accounts. And I just started thinking about that, praying about that, and I just thought it was like super important for us to start capturing that information from our family. At the time, I had one grandparent that was still surviving. I just thought it was super important that I take the opportunity to go spend some time with her and capture some of the stories she has on video. So in October of 2019, I booked a plane ticket up to go see her in Mount Vernon, Washington. That weekend, we were able to sit down for about an hour and just talk about some of the things that God's done in her life, some of the stories about her childhood, some of the things that she remembered about her family. And I just thought it was super cool because she had been going through some health problems at the time. And that weekend, she just really came alive for the interview. Some of the stories you're going to hear were even a surprise to us, things that the family hadn't even heard before. So I hope this will inspire you to maybe do something similar with your family or relatives or friends. I just wanna thank you for supporting the perspective and all that we do. I hope this project is just the beginning of many more like it to come in the future. And thanks for watching the video. My name is Gladys Josephine Weaver Chapman, and I was born in June 2nd, 1926. <laughs> I say it so often and I keep forgetting to. I can remember one time that uh, my mother was sick. She had had a heart attack. They had her bedridden. I was about six years old and I was in school, but I was the one that selected to stay home with her. And uh, so I was with her and uh, the stove pop blew. All of a sudden was all over the place. We had cold heat, you know, and all that sucked everywhere. And mama got out, out of bed to do something about it. And that scared me. And I ran out to the barn, trying to find Max, that's a guy that had the farm. And I couldn't find him. And just about that time, Grandma Stoltz and Uncle Carl drove in. Oh, I was so glad to see them. <laughs> Six years old, and I, I was seven years old, you know, say. And uh, trying to handle something like that when you knew your mother was about, could die any minute by with exertion. And at the time, we lived in a shack. But, but you could see you could see through the the cracks and you'd be out and you see through and when it would snow the snow would come through those cracks and at night we would have tons of blankets over us to keep us warm and uh, other than that we heated with cold and as soon as we'd get up out of bed we'd grab our clothes and we'd run to the stove and stand around the stove and get dressed <laughs> But I, I can remember that house so much because I, I was so embarrassed to be living in those conditions. And that was when my mother was sick. And uh, she went to the hospital from there. Yeah, she was only in her 30s, late 30s. I didn't get a chance to really know her. But she uh, had an abortion when she was young. And so she was the black sheep of the neighborhood for a while and so she was going through a lot and, and of course what the name meant to you or your family was the big thing in that day and that it's not like it is today uh, whatever you do does not affect your family according to the young people but at that time we, whatever we did affected the whole family and it wasn't just us That's, she was a black sheep at that time. She was always talking about God. She always, uh, we said our prayers. She got us to Sunday school if she could. 
and uh, I found out as I was growing up that she did accept Christ. Uh, it was a, not a formal thing that she wrote in her Bible, asking for forgiveness for her sins and asking him to accept her. So that's all I know about how that happened. I have the Bible. It's a little brown Bible. She wrote on the cover. It has been erased, but I can tell everything she had written if she was hard enough. And so I know she accepted Christ. So I would say she must have been in her 20s at that time. Yeah, other than that, I probably wouldn't know that she made any conversion. Well, only the fact that she tell us that Jesus was watching. Watch what we did because Jesus was watching. <laughs> kind of like Santa Claus was watching, you better get good. <laughs> she had a disease, what they call St. Gladys did. Uh, there's another scientific name for it now. And my cousin had that too in these later years and they had medication for it then. But she, my mother, I guess, would go out in the fields and just run and run and run. And they feel like she strained her, her heart at that time, whatever it might have been. They don't know. When she passed away, the doctor said her complete insides was over, oversized. Everything was enlarged. And it just couldn't, couldn't breathe. It couldn't move. The people that I talked to after her death, said she was the kindest, most gentle person they ever knew. She had a lot of good things said about her. And as I say, I, I, I knew her as a mother, but she was sick most of the time when I was growing up. One of the sisters were at the foot of the bed. She was in the hospital. She was in an oxygen tent. My dad was on one side, my grandma was on the floor, but she took another bed. And she was going in and out consciousness. And she said, oh, don't you see those flowers? Those beautiful flowers. And all the birds are singing. They're just beautiful. And uh, then she would come back and she would tell us something she would like to have us do in our lives. She knew she was dying. So she asked us to promise not to smoke or drink. But I think I'm the only one that completely fulfilled that not smoking and drinking. But the grandmas pretty took over for weekends. Dad, well, when mom was alive, it was her job to go to the teen parent teachers meetings and all of that. And, uh, but then after she died, he stepped in and did that. And uh, then he worked with the principal of the school and they got the school bus coming out in the country because there was no, no way to get to high school. And so he worked and they got the school bus coming out. And so there was a lot of kids got educated because of his efforts. You know? And uh, so he, he made a lot of changes after my mother passed away. And he took on his responsibilities. And he never married. And he kept all four of us girls together. And I, I wasn't the last one to leave the nest, but <laughs> Dorothy was the last one. When he was younger, they lived out on a farm. He was on a tractor. A cousin of his or something did something and it caught the tractor on fire. And my dad's leg got burnt real bad. And ever after that, he kept getting open sores from that leg. And I can remember her spending a lot of the time in the hospital when I was a little girl. He was in there quite a while. They said he had sugar poisoning, and he worked at the sugar factory. So they said he got sugar poisoning in that. Just about the time I got married, he was having trouble with an open sore, and he was doctoring in that. And I can remember the day before I got married, I just pulled out of the kitchen taking care of it, and it didn't look very really good. Then we got married, and the last time I saw him, he was on the steps of the church watching us as we drove by and waved at us. That was on a Wednesday night, 
in the following Saturday, he went to a dance. And uh, Uncle Henry didn't go with him this time for some reason or other. And uh, so he went to Fort Lupton to a fireman's dance. And then he met somebody there, according to what we hear. He met somebody there that wanted a ride to Brighton from the dance. So he drove them to Brighton. And then he was on, he had dropped them off evidently and uh, was on his way home. And then he stopped at this little cafe and uh, knocked on the door. Joe was already cleaning up and that. So he went to the door and just about the time he got to the door, my dad just dropped and he was dead. They said it was a clock. When I was married, we moved over to Edwards, Edwards, Colorado. I moved in with my sister, Eva May Lawson, and our families lived together for a while. And at that time, I met what they called the boys. They were preachers. And they weren't formal preachers, but they were they preached the gospel. And they would come around once a week and preach the gospel to the neighborhood. The boys kept visiting quite often. Bob, my husband, my brother-in-law, Paul, were in business together, and they were having problems between the two of them. Paul came to me and told me a, a story, and I fell for it and got some of the papers that he needed to do his business the way, way he wanted to. And so that made my husband Bob very unhappy. When he heard about it, he hit it out to go. He said, oh, I'm going to kill that man. And the boys were at the house at the time. So we prayed. And he changed his mind before he got there. So I meant, I say, there's the one, one thing that I can remember that prayer really worked. Bob and Paul never got along. Well, it was good when we separated. When we went down to Glenwood Springs, we found a place down there and he moved a bunch of sheep down there and took care of them. I lived in Eagle for a while with the kids so they could stay in school. Uh, it was kind of hard. It, we would see each other maybe on weekends, maybe not. We had moved to Carbondale and uh, the boys kept visiting all this time and, you know, talking about Christ and uh, I would go to the gospel meetings when I could. And then they had a uh, revival camp down in uh, Hotchkiss, Colorado. Just before they went down there, I talked to Art. That was one of the boys. And at the gospel meeting that night, I accepted Christ. And uh, then we went down to the uh, revival meeting, and that's when I was baptized in a real cold, cold stream in Colorado in June. So <laughs> it really got to me. <laughs> I definitely remember that. Bob was not a believer, so it was hard to put both lives together. He never objected, really, but uh, he expected his life to go on. So that's the way it was. Bob had a, a hatred, you might say, because, uh, well, he was in the service, so he must have been in his 20s. He had to leave and all his stuff was left at home. And while he was gone, uh, his group, Mankind United, talked to his mom and dad and got them to convert to whatever they were doing. And so mom and dad signed over their house and uh, all their belongings to this Mankind United. Or the promise that Mankind United would take care of them. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. <clears throat> Mankind used, used them as uh, slaves, working in the flower fields and stuff like that. And uh, until I got tired of that, 
But uh, anyhow, uh, mankind and I then took over and Bob stuff was in the house. And they got rid of all of that stuff. Records and stuff like that, you know. Music, we love music. That's another thing about kind of carrying over into the family. Not me, I don't have any talent of music at all, but uh, some of the family does. <laughs> and uh, then his sister had helped them pay for the house and they just put her out. So, I mean, he was, had a hatred or a, a vengeance against them. And so anytime any religion in my mansion, he was off. He didn't want any part of it. So that, that was the main thing that was keeping him from listening. And the boys, the preachers, talked to him a number of times. And so he knew the gospel. And he knew what it was all about. But he just wouldn't accept it because he was angry. But he lived with that anger. He didn't accept Christ until he was on his deathbed, you might say. And uh, he got cancer. And he went through a lot with that, taking the chemo and all the drugs and that. I had been reading the uh, Bible to Bob. And I uh, was reading in uh, 1 John. Keith, our pastor, would come down to Coeur d'Alene just visit with him every so often. So on this one day, Keith was down there on Wednesday and visited and that. I left him alone a number of different times so they could go ahead and talk. Not with me, not around. It wasn't when Keith was there, but it was the next day that Bob said, do uh, you suppose Keith would come down again? And I said, well, what? Well, I'm going to talk to him about God. So we called Keith and he came back down the next day. And uh, he read the, the prayer. And then Bob repeated it after him. And that's when he accepted Christ. That was on February 18th, I believe, 1991. And after that, he, he changed. But uh, he didn't know for sure. Just what was changing and you know our last year together was great it was we were able to talk about things and get things off our chest and uh, you know it was a, a memorable year for the both of us you know any marriage there's differences and uh, it, sometimes you can resolve them and sometimes they just stay under your skin accept them. <laughs> I think it was a year, maybe a year and a half before he died that he had accepted Christ. June 22nd, 1992. Maybe it was partly the fact that I had stayed in the faith and that's what the boys, the preachers used to say. If you are an example, He'll come around. It's not going. Pressure isn't going to get him to uh, want. To, he said, he'll go fight against it. Then. Grandpa's thankful. The patriarch. <laughs> <laughs> I think that this is wonderful that we can have all of the family together, most of the family, and I sure appreciate. Bob's doing as well. The Lord has answered these prayers. He has taught me a lot this year. And I'm thankful that Dad chose to have Jesus as his Savior. And, uh, it, it's, you know, all in all, it has been a, a rough year, but we can really count a lot of blessings through all these things. And I feel the Lord has just given us the time that we can learn and we can be better prepared for his work that he wants us to do.
On my mother's side, my grandmother did. Grandma Stoltz did talk about God and how we should behave according to what God would want us to do. But I'm not sure whether she actually made his, her conversion or not. She had her Bible and I know she read it. So whether she actually made a, a conversion or whether, you know, it was just a, a thing. But, uh, and now Grandpa Stoltz. There was nothing with him either. Of course, the men at that time wasn't macho. <laughs> but they, they were the head of the family, and that's what the way it was, and the, the women followed them. And if we believed, well, we followed quietly. Eva May did. She was the one that took me to uh, gospel meetings, and she accepted Christ. And she depended on him a lot, too, because Paul was not a very good provider and left her alone with the kids. So, And then uh, in this same group of uh, preachers, there was women. And so they followed up with her and uh, helped her out many, many times. And uh, so she, she accepted before I did. She's the one that got me started going to the gospel meetings. And so she and I were pretty close. Uh, Jessie went to church a lot. She was very active in the church, but I wouldn't say she ever made a conversion. Uh, she was pretty much important to herself. And uh, Dorothy, she claimed that she was a Catholic. She didn't discuss anything. I mean, as far as she was there, she was an atheist. She went to church with the Catholics, but her belief was not so. But later on, uh, between Donna and I, we kept telling her about Jesus and her, that when she was sick and everything. And towards the very last there, uh, she wrote a letter to me and uh, said that she now believed that was a couple years ago. She started paying attention and believing and changing her attitude a couple years before that. But then I didn't get the letter a couple years ago, just before she died. So I would say two of my sisters, definitely. Uh, Jessie did a lot of church work and she did a lot of good to people. I mean, she was always of service to someone. But she always bragged about it. it they never knew whether uh, she had the heart of Christ or whether it was just her. But, uh, she did a lot of the work in the church, so she tried. <laughs> Eva May, I, I dare note very definitely, she was a, a very sweet person to begin with, and then all the trouble that she went through just had brought her to Christ. Well, I was having health problems. I was having a lot of angina. And so we'd be giving me medication for that. Janice was gone on a vacation. 
So I was here alone. And it was on a Tuesday, and so I went out and I got the uh, trash cans and that and brought them back in. And on the way back in, my legs just like they were going to give out. Well, I continued to come on in. And I thought I was going to make it to my chair, but I didn't quite make it. And evidently, I passed out. But when I woke up, I was sitting on the floor. And uh, I drugged myself and got myself up into the chair. And three times that same day, I passed out. And one of those times, I was reading the paper. And uh, it, it, the black just came over on my face and the back of my neck and up over my head. And I blacked out like that. But then there was a light came on, a white light. I was in a room and a white light was all around me and all so peaceful. And I says, God, is this what it's like to be dead? I says, I am not afraid of it. And I says, I thank you for all you've done. And about that, that time, I snapped back to the earth again. <laughs> he didn't like what I was saying, evidently. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, that was an experience that I had that uh, your dad kind of holds on to, too. I saw the white light, but I said, it's not like the story I hear about people seeing the white light. They see it in a distance. With me, it was just all around me, and it was just such a pleasant thing. So peaceful, and I wanted to go, <laughs> and I got disappointed. <laughs> then it happened a couple more times during the day, and that's when they took me to the hospital. And that's when they decided to put my pacemaker. Maybe if we wouldn't have had that pacemaker, maybe I could be dead by now. <laughs> the doctors are keeping me alive. <laughs> that's one of those miracles, you know. <laughs> Just to live your life according to God's will. Most of my complaints to find out what God's will is. Because, uh, you can't direct your life in the manner that you would think. Uh, you know, go ahead and run, eat, drink, and be merry. But uh, you know, God, God wants you to do things His way. It doesn't mean that you can't be merry. You can be joyful. You can be full of the joy. And so you do things right. It's when you don't do things right when you get into rebellion that things aren't very joyful. And I know that too. I never was a rebellious child. I was pretty much mild. There was one time that I was just a little girl and I had a very, very bad temper. And uh, my three sisters were teasing me. And we were all out in the barn. And, uh, my temper got the best of me, and I picked up a pitchfork and threw it at them. Got they went in and told my mother. She came out there, and oh, I got the scolding of my life. And I sat on the chair in the kitchen for hours. It seemed like hours to me. But in a, a lecture about my temper, I had to control my temper. And you know, I have pretty much done so since then. <laughs> that was a lesson I did learn. <laughs> in high school, a uh, bunch of us kids would go out and they wanted the watermelon feeling one night. Oh, I knew I shouldn't. But I was with along with them. And uh, I had a guilty conscience all night. I didn't have fun at all. And I told them the next time, no, I can't go. <laughs> It, you know, it, it, my conscience pretty much told me when I was doing something very wrong. God, God has worked in me. And so it is what I've done, but what God has done in my life to reflect on other people.
egg rolls, egg rolls. A lot of the things that I've done in my life, I would I don't remember, I don't know, but I think God can use whatever I've done and every trying to follow Him. You can't live up to what the world is telling you, and you can't believe what all the other world of the world is saying. So you just have to lean on God that He would give you the wisdom to be able to tolerate it. Just pray that you will be the example he wants you to be. Be the kind of person he wants you to be. Mm -hmm. 